Hey. Hi. Okay? Yeah. I know it's one in the morning. I just wanted to talk. They call me Luna. Luna! Fire. Went out last night. Because my mind moves in tune with the lunar ships. They call me a lunatic. Sun burnt on the tip of the moon. What, what's going on? It's down to the minute the full moon's lit. It's going up in flames. Hey, Dad. What happened to your apartment? I'm just trying to figure out who I am. Why Even when I go out the I don't feel like myself. I saw myself involuntarily last night. Yes, you can't know, keep me here. Still not allowed no. To be no, 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 no. This is a hospital for sick people. I'm not sick. I can understand why you'd be here. You look very sick to me. There's no life in your face. Somewhere. We have two new people today, Emily and Marco. I go by Luna, my poet's name. You accidentally checked yourself into a mental institution. For just one <laughs> night. We of the craft are all crazy. You know who said that? We're not from here, you and me. These crazy connections between bipolar and artistic genius. Is it true that neither of you thinks you're from this planet? Marco, you're not healthy for one another. I don't think it's such a bad thing to feel life with the deepest emotion. You have to trust me right now. You can't listen to him. It's an illness. It needs to be treated. So you mean insanity? Love. You have to be crazy to be in love. I want the mania. You're not willing to make any sacrifices. Are we a mistake, Carla? Are we a mistake? The closer to each other they moved, the brighter they shined as we race through the days on that flame. Hi guys. I want to I want to open this by saying that Katie and I have been talking about this movie for a year and a half now in multiple interviews and it is so wonderful to see the finished product which you produced um, because it tackles a very just touchy subject matter with such grace and elegance and humor. And I think that uh, the line from the movie that probably in my opinion best summed it up was, if you think there's any romance in being crazy, you're crazy. Um, what drew each of you to this project specifically? <clears throat> well, I'm bipolar, so that was obvious. Um, and just knowing that there was this label uh, mm -hmm. that was so clinical and so degrading mm -hmm. that was defined by emotional extremes. So what happens when those emotional extremes take the form of love? <clears throat> you have a love that breaks outside the boundaries of sanity and it's almost too beautiful to even sustain, which would blaze away all those clinical diagnostic labels until you have something instead, which is touched with fire. And what about you, Ms. Holmes? You're not getting out of this one. <laughs> well, um, when I met Paul, and because I, I um, didn't know that much about bipolar prior to reading this script, and when I sat down with Paul and he shared with me that it was his personal experience, mm -hmm. and um, let me in on more of, 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 of what happened, and, and I, I felt really inspired to be a part of this because I think it's really powerful to go through something and then be willing to be outside of it enough to share that and create something out of it in, in an effort to celebrate it and make people aware of it and create a story and just create good entertainment and also bring about this awareness that hopefully does make people understand that it's not okay to have this stigma out mm -hmm. there and to acknowledge that um, this is happening. And um, anyway, I, I just thought it was so moving and, and Paul is so moving and so talented. And to put those things together, I just was really honored to be a part of it. Well, I agree with her. Um, I think another thing that sort of really uh, struck me was this love story. Mm -hmm. You know, it's um, there's something very dear about these two people finding each other. Uh, 
and being able to relate in a way that I don't think that they've experienced prior to that, uh, which is sort of the best version of young love. Uh, of their artistic selves, you could argue. Yeah, yeah, and just seeing, you know, seeing a reflection of, the, of yourself in another person and, and for two people that have felt so removed from the status quo all their lives, to have mm -hmm. something bring them back mm -hmm. into their own version of normalcy, uh, you know, was beautiful and worth exploring. Um, I've been friends with Paul for about 10 years, and he called me up and sent me the script, and I read the script, and after reading it, um, I knew I had to be involved with it and help him tell the story, which is such a personal journey that he went through. I mean, both of the characters that these two actors so wonderfully portray are sort of parts of what Paul went through. Mm -hmm. And when I read it, it resonated as being such a personal, powerful story that I, I had to drop everything and, and literally come out from California to New York and, uh, and help him. And get to uh, work. And get to work, yeah. Luke and Katie, how did you guys form your, how did you cement your relationship and make it so real? Well, it was, it was all on the page, and we did have a lot of, we had time to rehearse, time to research these characters. I think both of us uh, felt a huge responsibility to serve these characters in the most authentic mm -hmm. way. And fortunately, Paul was uh, there to guide us and, and to measure our performances, were, to make sure the highs were high enough, the lows mm -hmm. were low enough. Um, and we uh, really just let go and, and let the characters take over and we knew it was important to support each other because it was a very vulnerable uh, performance for both of us. So, um, you know, I, it, it, was, it was a real, there was a real team around us. I think, you know, it didn't take long to figure out that we were locked in to something and uh, I was so impressed with Katie's curiosity and determination and also just um, her playfulness. Mm -hmm. you know, that's really all you can ask for in this situation. And Given the nature of these characters, they all do have a very uh, playful energy. And so that you know, was very encouraging. And then we just kind of... I don't know the, the, you three, but I do know Katie a little bit. And she does have a really sweet lightness to her that I yes. think... Really I thought it was just because I have a good playlist. <laughs> <laughs> iPad. I thought that's what you said. Thank you. Well, Paul, how did it feel to see, quote unquote, your story being played out in front of you or aspects of your own story? It was beautiful and cathartic, especially <clears throat> because what started out as aspects of myself that were mm -hmm. written into these characters became them. And they weren't acting. I mean, they were, they became the characters, the characters became them. Uh, with their intent, they both had an intense drive uh, that was clearly uh, reflected in, in the fact that they were, they had something in themselves that was the character. And they have the rare qualities of actors of having extraordinary emotional range and extraordinary imagination. So when they delved deep into the character and found and characters and found what it was about them that was linked, their imagination could make the leap to the broadest ranges of their emotion that were on the verge of bipolar. And so when they came to life, you know, it was so thrilling to see resurrected aspects of myself merge with aspects of them as they collided in this intense, passionate. Uh, love and I didn't have to do much on set in terms of I wasn't I mean they say that I was helping them stay but they were being themselves they weren't playing anything from the outside I was just maybe giving them yeah you want to try this you want to try that but they were on fire and none of that acting was exterior and that's why we can feel through their skin and see through their eyes and feel their love because of their talent as actors and feel how scary it is, right? I mean, so much it's of the part of the beauty. terrifying. Part of the beauty. For each of you two uh, actors, um, what was the most challenging part of playing these characters? I think one of the challenges was sort of feeling confident that we were, um, you know, doing it justice. Uh, you know, I think that's always part of the uh, struggle. You know, you kind of 
you have to throw yourself into something. And you, there's really no way of knowing if what you're doing, you know, has purchase or not. And, you know, Paul was there to sort of, you know, be be our um, barometer. And, um, that to me was the challenge. That sort of nagging voice that says, <clears throat> "You're an idiot. You're terrible. <laughs> you suck." You know. Uh, I, I think it was, um, I, I mean, I, I, I had a great time making this movie. I think that, you know, we had a wonderful cast and crew and, and, and uh, wonderful leaders. And we were allowed to have the freedom to create every day. So as much as it was very, um, uh, you know, it, it took a lot of energy it was really liberating as a as a performer to be able to try things, and we were allowed to improvise a lot and uh, really be a part of creating these with these characters with Paul and with each other. So I found that to be so rewarding as an actor. We we were given the dignity of of having a point of view, and you know mm -hmm. we weren't puppets. Um, and that was really helpful because these were characters that um, that were hard to play, and to and, say the least. Yeah, and and also, I mean, it was like the beautiful aspects of them, and then the the scary parts that they were going through, and and the vulnerable parts. I mean, it was when you think about it, it's like, oh my gosh, that's so. That must have been so. You know, it's it was just a lot. So. It was nice to have the safety that was on set. Of the producers sitting here, who's the biggest perfectionist? Katie. Paul. <laughs> Paul, yeah, Paul, no yeah, question. Yeah, for really? sure, yeah. To a really annoying degree, actually, I think I... <laughs> like they had to... Frustrated a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's, we, we did a screening at UCLA last week, mm -hmm. and there, there's stuff during the movie that I would say to Paul, um, Sort of my philosophy as a producer is to support the director's vision no matter what. I'm mm -hmm. also a director, so I produce the way I would want someone to produce when I'm directing. So I stood beside Paul and supported everything he wanted to do and put on screen. And at some point, I would pull him aside and say, Paul, no one's going to notice that. But he was getting so specific on certain things. But actually, we did a screening last week to a psychiatrist at UCLA, uh -huh. and he picked up on a lot of the subtle nuances that Paul did. And I said, well, I was wrong. Some people would pick Yeah, I was up. so excited rubbing his face. You were like, Because that was like, an ongoing been debate. Been I, was like, I was always like, there's going to be that one person. You know, There's going to be that one person that's worth it. And, uh, and, and sometimes <clears throat> it could have been frustrating for the actors because I was giving them direction, but then they'd see me like moving a plastic ball in the background, and they'd be... <laughs> And I'd be like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> to come back and talk to them. I mean, you were seriously that detailed that you were moving a plastic ball? Because yeah. it I mean, to me, that's the art of film. Oh, yeah. Is to be able to be so vivid and, and, uh, and really uh, saturate the senses of the audience, especially mm -hmm. with this film where you're seeing through manic senses and hearing through manic ears. It was important. The, the last day of filming, um, well, one of the challenges we had on the movie is our cinematographer, who's Paul's wife. She was also one of the producers. She was seven, eight, and nine months pregnant when we made the film. Oh, that's no big deal. What's the problem? Exactly. Oh, my God. Um, but the second to last day of filming, we were filming the beginning and mm -hmm. end of the movie, um, and, and, and Christina was in the hospital getting ready to give birth to Paul's, Paul and their son, um, and we're rushing to get through everything to be able to make the day. I had a PA outside with a car running, waiting to take him to the, to the hospital. Um, but if you look at that scene behind... Uh, both Katie and Luke, there's books, and all the books were meticulously designed. Paul was spending time arranging mm -hmm. the books so that all the bipolar authors were facing out, and there was a color scheme back there. Oh my so God. even in the midst of the most insane, frenetic day on the set, his attention to detail was there. I just have to say, your wife is so selfish. I mean, she couldn't wait an extra day to give birth. Yeah, I, I don't even, I can't even. That's why she's not here. We didn't let her. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I totally would exclude her also. Katie and I are parents, like we know, like, I mean, please. You don't, you know. <laughs> um, what, Luke, what surprised you the most about working with Katie? Aside from what I hear is an amazing playlist. Uh, that's about it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, I, I, uh, I was really su just surprised at her uh, realness, uh, just in terms of being, you know, at the job, and mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, surprised, 
I didn't, I didn't go in with huge expectations, but I, I was impressed with it. And also uh, just her, um, you know, uh, work ethic. You know, just she's a very um, driven actor and is there and present at all times. So, you know. And my playlist. She, okay, what is on this playlist? Okay playlist. Play <laughs> this legendary playlist, what is on it? No, I did hear a little Eminem coming out of it. <laughs> yeah, I, was, I was like, mm, I like that. That's cool. Yeah. Um, and Katie, I know you and I have talked about this before, but you're producing this. You just directed a movie. I don't know if they've dragged you out of the editing bay yet because um, I think the last time we spoke, you were still like, I don't know, this is, I need everything to be just right. Um, what propelled you to be so active behind the scenes? Oh, well, I, I think that it's, it, I've had um, a lot of wonderful experiences and this movie, Touched with, with Fire, being one of the most amazing experiences. And, um, and when you're around people that are passionate and talented and inspiring, such as the people that I'm sitting with today, it makes you go, oh, well, maybe I could try something just a little bit bigger than what I've done before. Mm -hmm. And that's basically, you know, I, I feel very grateful for all of my experiences. So it's like, okay, well, how do I uh, keep working really, really hard? Because I'm, I'm lucky that I, I got to learn. So what am I going to do with that? That's kind of... And when you guys are approaching a subject matter this difficult and this thorny, I don't want to say dark because I don't think it's really... I mean, it's very funny in a lot of places, the film. How do you leave these characters behind when you go home at night? Well, I mean... Have a glass of wine? No, I mean, we, we, we shot uh, uh, usually like a half an hour away, so you have like that time to transition. And we also, I mean, we had a lot of fun on set too. So we would have these big scenes and then we would go and like listen to music and jump around and sort of like uh, relax a little. And uh, I mean, I, when I work, I get home and I, I, I can go right to bed. Like, <laughs> I can go right to bed anytime. Like, right, you know. Like, right now, you could fall asleep? I could. Oh, cool. Which <laughs> is kind of part narcoleptic and it's weird, but <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, that's what I. And a lot of cooking. I like to cook. Uh, yeah, you know. You like to cook too? I like to cook. You know, you decompress, I guess. You know, the drive is a good way to do it. Going for a walk is a good way to do it. Sometimes the work just sort of, you know, filters through your dreams, and you just try to deal with it in the, <clears throat> the most, um, I guess, the, be the best way to still be a, a reliable person in your real life, you know. Um, but it's, it is something that you sort of, you know, I, you carry with you throughout the, the project. It's not, um, it doesn't entirely go away, but... Try to be good to the people you love. And this is a question especially, I think, for Paul. Do you think that there's a mythology attached to kind of the, the connection between bipolar or highs and lows in emotions and art, that you have to experience those emotions to be an artist? There's just a, <clears throat> a huge correlation just in reality mm -hmm. between uh, art and, and bipolar and emotional extremes, which is the, basically the original book, Touch With Fire, yeah. was the scientific, tangible correlation done by a uh, psychologist, psychologist yeah. who's bipolar, you know? And so for me, it was important to show the redeeming aspects of it so that these people aren't looked at like just like sick, uh, dysfunctional people because that's where the stigma comes from, from the fact that people are looking at these people uh, as if they're under a microscope mm -hmm. and you're in a lab coat and every label you have to choose from is in some way disorderous dysfunction in their humanity when the truth is that some of the greatest people, artists in history, 38% of Pulitzer Prize winning poets, uh, who, which is the award given to those people who made the biggest contributions to the mm -hmm. human spirit, uh, are labeled a human defect. There's something wrong with that in terms of the stigma. And so this was a way of redeeming it. That is so fascinating because, I mean, I've always read these random articles saying, like, Ernest Hemingway would not have been who he was if he was sober. But is that, you know, you read that and you're like, really? 
I mean, humanity's most beloved image of the sky was seen through the sanitarium window, through manic eyes. Uh, but you'll leave the MoMA and walk by a homeless guy in the street gazing up at the sky with bloodshot eyes and a crazy smile, and you'll cross the street to avoid walking yeah. past him. I think that's important to make that connection. And what are each of you doing next? Uh, well, I'm going to get ready to play Jacqueline Kennedy again in okay. um, sort of a period piece, which I'm excited about. Really? That's exciting. Thank you. I am excited. Uh, and I'm going to go to the MoMA. <laughs> I was there last night, and I looked at Starry Night again. I'm going to have lunch. And... Uh, I work on a television series called Rectify that's on Ooh. Sundance TV. Yeah. And uh, we're going to go back and do our fourth season uh, down in Georgia in April. Okay. I think it'll be out uh, in the early fall. And you, sir? Um, I'm going to make sure everyone goes and sees this movie opening weekend <laughs> and the weekend after. No, really, it's a wonderful, wonderful movie. And like I told you back there, you know, it's so nice to finally see it because you guys do justice to a subject that could have been mishandled any number of ways, I think. And actually, for each of you as actors, what was kind of your guide, guidelines, so to speak, when approaching your characters? I just wanted to, you know, uh, free up the reins of control, and just sort of um, make it more of an exercise in like just f flinging paint and letting Paul determine, you know, uh, what of it had value. Just sort of trying to um, limber up. Well, I, I, I mean, I, I'm so grateful. I think Paul deserves such a round of applause for putting together uh, this movie that um, allows the audience to experience uh, what we try to achieve through characters. Um, it's a beautiful movie, and to put, like I said, to put your own experience out there uh, is incredible, and um, I think that uh, I love that it's, there's a love story there, because everyone can relate to that, and it really draws you in, and, um, and then you get to learn something. I learned so much on this movie. Like I said, I didn't know much about bipolar. I didn't know that all of these artists, 38% mm -hmm. of Pulitzer Prize winning poets were considered defected. And, and I think that um, in a time when, when we are so quick to judge and label, uh, it, it's really rewarding to be a part of, of something that, um, destigmatizes and, and hopefully opens some eyes and, and, and celebrates differences. And that's a great starting point for our audience. Q uh, questions? Hello, guys. Thank you guys for coming in today. So kind of relating to what you guys just talked about um, in, in reference of like preparing for this role, was there a movie or a film that you guys watched to help you get into the right character mode as like a reference? Nope. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I didn't, I didn't do that. But I, we, 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 uh, I, we did a lot of research. Paul gave us a lot of wonderful books. I was reading a lot of poetry because my character was a poet, mm -hmm. and um, and working on it from that standpoint, more inside out instead of outside in. Yeah, I mean, I think you you, you have to uh, just be open to the general soup of what you've consumed in your life when it comes to this work. So anything can sort of um, have some kind of place in the in the process. Um, but yeah, it wasn't anything specific um, for me. I mean, there were things that you know Paul and I sort of related uh, to one another, and that you know he gave me books that you know um, were inspiring to him that I sort of used to sort of get into certain places mm -hmm. with it, um, but yeah. 
Hi, thanks for being here. Huge fan of all you guys. Um, so excited to see the film. Um, so this is for you, um, Katie. What was it like playing Jacqueline Kennedy? <laughs> oh. Uh, I'm nervous too, so <laughs> it's all good. What's your name? Parker. Parker. Where are you from? Oh, I'm from Ohio. Where? Right. Cleveland. Cleveland. I love Cleveland. Yep. I <laughs> love it. Yeah. Uh, yes. I shot Miss Meadows in Cleveland. Okay. Yeah. Cool. And I, anyway. Uh, it was wonderful to play Jackie Kennedy. I'm really looking forward to doing it again. And this this time will be uh, after, it's called After Camelot. So it's the years after uh, Bobby died. It starts when Bobby died. Hi guys, thanks for being here. I'm curious if it was um, difficult to get this abstract stuff, which is very above the shoulders and romantic and poetic and beautiful. But uh, to capture it, you said you read a lot of poetry. So it's been captured in words, but was it tough to put it into film? <clears throat> um, I think it was very important, as, as they said, that they approach the role from the inside out. And I think that there's many relatable aspects of bipolar. You're basically experiencing the aspects that make you human on a deeper level. And what makes their performances so brilliant is that they weren't playing bipolar. They were being themselves, but they just pushed themselves to the outer brink of their humanity. Um, and every single person who has seen this film who's bipolar said, that's what it's like. That's what it's like. There wasn't one person who didn't say that. And I think because of that, it's, it's the first time I've seen a performance where you're not looking at these people from the outside as being, okay, what are they doing? They're sick. Mm -hmm. You're actually in their skin. And they're the, I think they're the first actors that achieve that as bi someone with bipolar and also as all the doctors and patients who've talked to me at screenings. And we have time for one more question, please. Hey guys, uh, I have a question for Luke and Katie. Uh, what did you guys learn from your characters after filming? I feel like I'm still learning. I mean, in the last couple of weeks, we've uh, been to a few Q and A's um, with where mental health practitioners have been present along with um, support groups. And that has been a, a real education for me in, in, in how much um, treatment and support uh, there is out there and how much of a dialogue there is uh, going on about mental health and how uh, important that is. Uh, I've just felt uh, very um, moved by that, to see that happening. And the fact that people are connecting to the film um, sort of, you know, is a, uh, authenticates our work in a way that uh, is very encouraging. And anything that sort of moves the conversation forward is a good thing, especially uh, given a history of, you know, sweeping these sorts of things under the rug. Uh, you know, so I'm very moved by that. Well, um, I learned so much from, from playing Carla, but more from working with Paul. And um, I don't know what it's like to be bipolar. I, um, but I know that there's such beauty, and I saw so much beauty from Paul. And I feel very happy that this film really celebrates uh, such wonderful parts and humanizes this disease so that people don't feel that that's, that they're just their illness. And I think that's really important. And I think that I learned that we have to, I have to, it, you know, it's, uh, you have to celebrate the wonderful parts of people. And uh, that's what I really learned from this. Thank you to our wonderful cast, director and producers. And thank you guys. The movie, the movie opens Friday and goes wide the following week.